Hey everyone, back again. I hope you had a good break. If you took a break, I took a break. Happy to be back, and no better place to start than to start a very long series of episodes on Foucault's lectures at the Collège de France. And here we're going to be starting with the 1970-71 lectures on the will to know. And then, as you might have guessed, I'm going to be covering all of the remaining lectures. Uh, maybe not in a row, because that might be dry. I might insert other texts in between them. But they're going to be my general focus, probably for this entire year. Uh, so hope you stay tuned and you'll learn lots as we go through this. Now, this episode is going to cover weeks one and week two. What I'm going to do, and it's going to be four episodes in total covering this text, the lectures on the will to know. It's important that I lay this out as well, that I'm actually going to be covering week 13 at the beginning of the next episode. Now, we're going to get into that more. I'll explain it more then. And the reason for that is that the content of week 13 is more relevant to that time between weeks two and week three than it is as week 13 at the very end. So I'm just saying that now, but this episode is going to cover just weeks one and week two. Now, before jumping into it, hi, I'm David. I explain philosophical concepts and ideas and ways to make them accessible to you. So if you're new here, you can go and see my 300 episodes I already have up on YouTube or on any podcast platform. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find just the audio on a podcast platform if you'd prefer that, which is great. Or if you found this on a podcast platform, you might be interested in knowing that sometimes I release videos as well if you want to go check me out on YouTube. Check me out on YouTube. I mean, check out my stuff on YouTube. So this lecture begins, well, being in 1970-71, it's important to situate this text more broadly within his canon. Uh, you know, if we we really sit, we call this a text, you know, it's a series of lectures. But this is coming after he'd written Madness and Civilization, and he'd written The Order of Things. And I guess the archaeology of knowledge had come out, and the roots of the birth of the clinic had come out. So he had a number of texts already out. And he says right, at the, right off the bat in his lecture that all of those texts could have also been subtitled The History of the Will to Know. That is, looking at the way in which knowledge and the will to know have been used, mobilized, deployed throughout history. And as the title of this lecture might have led you to believe, he here is really going to be thinking about knowledge and how knowledge emerged, looking at the Greeks, all the way up just briefly to the present day, but really focusing on the Greeks. So his focus here will be uh, to both look at the historical instances in the organization and deployment of knowledge, and also to analyze the very will to know itself, the desire to know, to acquire knowledge. Now, the general focus here, he, this is what he says, will be in 19th century France, specifically penality, the prison system in 19th century France, which, spoiler alert, he doesn't do at all. We don't see that here in this text. This will come up in later lectures, uh, you know, the later volumes, but not in this one, just so you know. So one of his guiding questions is whether or not the will to truth or the will to knowledge is as historically contingent, arbitrary, and maybe imposed as is discourse more generally. And what we're going to do here is is look at the ways in which knowledge as a category of possible knowledge, knowledge as knowledge, something that can be sought, pursued, uh, really uh, acquired, how that emerged in Greece in the 6th and 7th centuries um, you know, BCE in Greece, and how it would be formalized and almost concretized with the work of Plato, or, well, more specifically, Aristotle, but we're going to get into that as we go on here. But just a moment ago, I implied that the will to truth and the will to knowledge were the same thing, which might be true, but it might not be true. And this is going to inform another question that he wants us to hold on to as we go through this lecture, and that is, what is the distinction between the will to truth and the will to knowledge? What is the distinction between truth and falsity? Is the will to truth or the will to knowledge, simply a will to truth over that of falsity? And how do we distinguish between the two? 
Now, another important thing to lay out here is that in French, there are two words for knowledge. There's savoir and connaissance, where in the English, we just translate both of these terms to knowledge. And there's just a difficulty here when it comes to translating. If anyone's done any translation work, you'd know that context is very, very important. So in the Foucauldian sense, when he talks about savoir, that is, you know, we just use the word knowledge, he's talking about knowing facts, knowing, um, you know, knowing about science, knowing, uh, knowing about any kind of really just facts, whereas connaissance refers to understanding or being familiar with a person, with a place, with a set of rules that aren't necessarily clearly established. So I want to give you an example to think about this. If you walk into a doctor's office, even before you've arrived, you have engaged in the world of connaissance in that you understand and you're familiar with the dynamics that are going to occur there. The doctor is going to be hierarchically superior to you in that they have, they've uh, established their place as being superior in that realm in medicine. Now, once you actually get into the office, the doctor demonstrates their savoir. That is their knowledge of facts about your body, your health, about anyone's body, anyone's health. So connaissance refers more broadly to an understanding of things that might not be written down or codified or clearly established, whereas savoir is going to refer to things that can be verified, established, that determine one's, uh, one's degree of knowledge. And as we go through the text here, I'm going to be using just using the term knowledge, but I'm hoping that with this example, you'll know when I've used, um, when I'm referring to connaissance or to savoir. There are going to be moments when I clarify, when I don't think it's clear, but I'm going to try and make it as abundantly clear as possible. Just know, connaissance is like a tacit um, knowledge of the rules of, of any kind of scenario or situation that allows you to navigate that situation. Whereas savoir is having these specific, uh, these specific uh, pieces of information or knowledge or facts that, you know, can do anything, anything they'll do for you in that moment. So a few more guiding questions Foucault offers us in order to set the stage for the, all these series of lectures. And some of them include, why did a consideration of the will to knowledge even emerge? And he's going to give us examples from Aristotle in which he justifies, Aristotle justifies the human's desire for knowledge, their pursuit of knowledge. And Foucault asks, why did this emerge? Because, you know, even before then, and even after then, there have been efforts to understand knowledge historically, like where has it accumulated? Um, what ideas have gained cultural prominence? And all of these types of things, which is a totally legitimate study in itself. But the very study of the desire to attain knowledge is different. And Foucault is interested in why that would even have come up. Moreover, uh, what place does philosophy occupy here? Is philosophy participating in the pursuit of knowledge or does philosophy create knowledge that can be pursued or maybe it's both and in a proper Foucauldian fashion he asks is even the consideration or the study of the will to knowledge does that construct the idea of there being this sovereign autonomous being in the world that can even will desire pursue anything as though they are their own free individuality, as though the, even the drive for the will to knowledge cannot itself be imposed from elsewhere, where you are forced to go and pursue knowledge. You know, you think it's your own doing, you think you want to find knowledge, whereas it might be enforced, which is what, or imposed upon you, which is something, a possibility that Foucault leaves some room for. So now he turns to Aristotle specifically Aristotle's metaphysics, to show how philosophy embraces truth, historically, at least in that text, while never explicitly saying that it's like 
oh, I'm, I'm just trying to find the truth. It couches that pursuit in other claims, like finding, uh, like in Aristotle, like finding what is virtuous, which is just assumed to be connected with the truth as far as what true human conduct is. You know, looking for the golden mean or trying to find, you know, what makes you um, a more fulfilled human in the world. So Foucault focuses specifically on one uh, passage, and we'll get into more as we go on, but he starts out with this one, and it goes, All men by nature desire to know. The proof of this is the pleasure caused by sensation, for even part, apart from their usefulness, we enjoy them for themselves, and visual sensations more than others. So let me repeat that once more. All men by nature desire to know. The proof of this is the pleasure caused by sensations, for even apart from their usefulness, we enjoy them for themselves, and visual sensations more than the others. So to put it quite simply, Aristotle is saying that we all have a desire to know, and the reason we have a desire to know is that we experience sensations that feel good just in themselves, that have no purpose, but they just feel good. Like, if you listen to music that you like that does virtually nothing for you as a human in the world, music does nothing. Because we have that connection to something that is enjoyable, aside from its usefulness, you know, in an evolutionary sense, then therefore we as humans are opened up to higher order possibilities, which is what we're just using here to understand as knowledge. And then there's the added bit that Aristotle says that visual pleasure is greater than all the others. So the fact that we can enjoy a work of art, even though it has no utility as far as it, what it means to be human, it's not feeding us, it's not giving us water, not shelter, but we can nevertheless find, find a great amount of meaning in it. Now, if anyone's familiar with Aristotle, you, you know, this would probably make sense to you. Uh, it, it makes sense to me. And even if you're not familiar with Aristotle, this passage probably makes sense. You might disagree with it, but you might understand what it's telling you. you. You might get it as far as the thesis goes. Now, Foucault takes a moment here to suggest that there's one way of interpreting this text, and this text belongs to what he calls, in the English translation, a philosophical operator. That is, it belongs to a canon that can help us understand that text, but it's not totally necessary. Whereas by contrast, he suggests there can be epistemic operators. And these are texts that exist outside of a canon that largely break a field wide open. And one of the examples he gives is Saussure's uh, course on general linguistics, which just just completely overturned, um, overhauled, bouleversed, to, to use a terrible Englishism of a French word, uh, that completely overturned the field. Now, that's not totally important. Anyways, back to Aristotle. So Foucault begins by breaking down this passage. And he starts with the first line that says, all men by nature desire to know. Foucault says, suggests that there are three theses here. There are three primary ideas in the sentence that all men by nature desire to know. And the three theses are that there is a desire that is focused on knowledge to have a desire to know. Desire wants knowledge. The second thesis is that this desire is universal and found in all men. You know, all men pretty clear. The third one is that it is given by nature. So to summarize, there is a desire that is focused on knowledge. It is universal and it comes from nature. Now this is an example of an enthymeme. An enthymeme is a type of reasoning in which there is part of an argument that is omitted yet is crucial to actually understanding the conclusion drawn from the argument. So for example, and I I think I pulled this one from online because it made sense. Um, for example, if I said that all insects have six legs, therefore wasps have six legs, this is an enthymeme because I never said that insects are wasps, but you know it to be the case because we just know. So when I say that all insects have six legs, therefore wasps have six legs, what has gone unsaid is that wasps are insects. So if an alien species came to earth, they might be like, but are wasps insects? Like, how do I know that this is true? 
So this is just a type of reasoning in which part of the argument is omitted. And this might have a bearing on the conclusion, that, or it might not. It might be a way to trick someone. Now, in the case of Aristotle's passage, the enthymeme, or, or not, it's not specifically the enthymeme, but specifically the thing that was omitted, is the idea that there is something in nature that supplies the condition for knowledge. So when he says that all humans by nature desire to know, and then makes this, this argument, he is assuming that within nature there is the something that supplies us our drive for knowledge. But, of course, he goes on. So he says that uh, this is found, the proof of this is found in the fact that we pursue pleasure that isn't useful. Like, we don't, it doesn't feed us, it doesn't give us shelter, nothing useful. Specifically sight, that is, you know, he says that vision is the highest order of, uh, of sensation. So here, he, what he's doing is assuming that sensation is connected with the knowledge. Sensation is seen as valuable in itself because it is pleasurable, as though by nature sensation has no utility, or it can have no utility. So how can he say this? Well, in order for him to be able to say this, he has to prove three things, or he has to, doesn't have to prove them, but two, three things have to be true. That sensation is knowledge, that sensation is accompanied by pleasure, and that this pleasure is connected with what makes sensation knowledge. So you receive a sensation, you experience a sensation, it gives you pleasure, and therefore this is a sign of knowledge for Aristotle, which Foucault is, you know, not totally convinced about. But Foucault's point here is not to just say that Aristotle is wrong because this is a bad argument. He's saying that, and this is, I think... I hope that this is going to give you an idea of the trajectory of this this text, these lectures. What Foucault is saying is that within such discourse, which in, within such efforts to understand knowledge, was a desire to impose knowledge, to make it something that was almost natural, and therefore uh, justified the philosopher's existence in this specific form, finding real justification in the world for the pursuit of knowledge, which is very difficult to uh, refute against, because once it has been established that knowledge is seen as natural, or that sensation is connected to knowledge, any opposition to that can be easily written off as being, oh, you're you're just against human nature, you're just uh, you, you don't believe in truth, or some something else like that. You're a relativist, or something. Whereas Foucault is clearly identifying, and he's going to go much further back than Aristotle to show that this wasn't always the case. There were very different approaches to knowledge uh, before Aristotle. Now, what else is interesting is that if you were to follow along Aristotle's line of inquiry, there's no reason to say that this doesn't also apply to animals because animals experience sensations that they find pleasurable and that are useless in themselves. And if anyone has pets, you'll know that this is very true. Like uh, my, my cats will play with toys with no like no purpose as far as I know. Maybe it's to satisfy some uh, deep-seated desire to, to be a predator in nature. Or my one big cat likes to lie it down on the counter when the washing machine is on so that he can he can feel the warmth from the washing machine, which I'm pretty sure serves no function other than it feels good. Uh, like maybe there's some function, but anyways, I think my point is clear enough that animals just do things because they feel good, not necessarily because they have some purpose as far as them being animals. So why then would Aristotle reserve this for humans to say that all men, you know, men being a term used to describe all humans, all men have this desire. Why not all beings, all creatures? Well, Aristotle might say that animals lack memory in the way that humans have. Uh, so therefore, they are not able to extract as much value out of seeing, out of their pleasurable experiences in the world, as humans can, to leave room for possible speculation and reflection upon those feelings. They just feel them. But this is assuming, of course, that humans think about things. I mean, lots of humans don't think about things. They just do things. And if it feels good, they'll just do that. 
Uh, we are still very much just animals at the end of the day. So these are a number of problems, but we're going we're gonna to go on. How does Aristotle, you know, assuming that the animal thing is just a moot point, doesn't matter, it's like a cow's opinion, <laughs> it's a friend's joke, uh, how does Aristotle jump from associating useless sensation with knowledge to say that because we enjoy things in themselves, you know, because they have no use, that therefore that is a sign of knowledge? Uh, and how do we go from that to assuming then that all that therefore all humans desire to know or desire knowledge? And the answer is found in the terminology. Whereas if someone just enjoys an activity for itself, the Greek word would have been hedone which we would have gotten the word like hedonism, which is, uh, you know, just uh, pleasure that is conducted probably that'll be bad for us, like doing too many drugs and or drinking too much alcohol. Like it might feel good. You might have a good time, but it's going to be bad for you. Now, the other Greek word to understand these pleasures is eudaimonia. When I, my pronunciation is going to be garbage, but eudaimonia. And this is a term that is going to be used to describe pleasures that resonate with virtuous actions and contemplation. So these are maybe pleasures you get out of working out, uh, which is something that we'd find in Aristotle, like, you know, improving your body, the pleasure you get out of that, which might even assume the form of pain in the instance, but you do it anyways because of the rewards it'll benefit you, the feeling of relaxation that comes afterward. Now, Aristotle doesn't use either of these terms when he's discussing uh, when he's discussing this idea. Instead, he uses the term <laughs> agapesis, which I guarantee I mispronounced. Agapesis. That refers to something of a mix of hedone and eudaimonia which is the pleasure of sensation as well as something which heralds the happiness of contemplation. So this is something that feels good. It's not like punishing yourself to live a more virtuous life, like reading, studying a lot, working out a lot in the Aristotelian sense. Uh, this is actually, at least this term, agapesis, is referring to immediate pleasures that feel good, but that signal the possibility of contemplation that push you in the direction of virtuousness. So insofar as everyone desires satisfaction, all people then therefore desire knowledge, for they imply one another. If we use this term, if he's using this term, this term implies that the activity is done that feels good for the sake of possible contemplation and reflection. So, you know, it comes down to translation. It's not just about pleasure for the sake of pleasure. There is a lot that is connotated, connoted. Wow. Uh, mind blank. Uh, a lot is connoted, connotated, geez, in the term agapesis that, um, that really holds a lot of weight in understanding Aristotle's argument or believing it. But there is a limitation to all this for Foucault, and that is that in Greek tragedy, knowledge is often denied to the protagonists, like Oedipus, for example. Uh, and this is denied by the gods, it's denied by fate, and so on. So in that case, Oedipus is, doesn't have knowledge. He's always pursuing knowledge. But this knowledge that he pursues is not pleasurable. It's, it's something entirely different. Now, more problems emerge when we think about Socrates, for example. And Socrates' question, why do we desire to know? To which Aristotle's argument seems to render this question useless because we apparently already have knowledge or the desire to realize that knowledge. And that is because for Aristotle, as he says, we just naturally pursue knowledge because we can naturally see and, and enjoy things we see and naturally contemplate those things, naturally reflect upon them, naturally try to pursue knowledge and virtue. Therefore, there's no point to ask, as Socrates does, why do we desire to know? Like we just do. It's part of our the fabric of our being. It's not as though we don't desire to knowledge, desire to know, and then one day, you know, some people pursue it. We all have it. And this idea also rubs up against those instances where people use knowledge to be unvirtuous. But wouldn't this, like, I guess this opens up a bigger issue where, like, people will use their knowledge to do bad things, 
knowledge they have in the world. They'll use pleasure that they can experience for bad things. Like if someone takes pleasure, useless pleasure in watching people suffer, this could hardly be considered virtuous. I, I hope no one would think that that is virtuous. But in any case, it demonstrates the limits of Aristotle's idea that humans just have a natural propensity for pleasure and therefore a natural propensity for knowledge and that there's a connection between these two things and uh, virtue. Now, this idea also conflicts with Plato's location of supreme knowledge in the metaphysical realm of forms. So, <laughs> to be really quick about that, in Plato, what we see and feel in the world are just reflections. They are just um, simulations of their true beings, their true essences that are beyond our grasp, that exist in this divine realm that we just do not have access to, yet supplies the conditions for everything we see and feel in the world. So in the world, we essentially were just puppets playing with ideas like justice, truth, love, and we might never actually fully enact these things because their full trueness is, is, is kept away from us in this divine realm. So for Plato, it's not as though we can really attain truth in this everyday uh, mundane existence. It can only be acquired in the realm of forms, which, you know, we might be able to access, I don't know, however you want to read Plato. But the point then is that knowledge is not found here. Implicitly, it's not found here. It's reserved for a few people who might be able to acquire that access to that domain. Whereas Aristotle says that it is actually in the very pursuit of such knowledge that we, we, we find pleasure. We find pleasure in the pursuit of that knowledge. And it is in that pursuit because it is pleasurable that we uh, all desire knowledge. It's just part of who we are. So to put it really simply, for Plato in the human world, it is the act of thinking that elevates us and reveals to us a truth, knowledge. So it is a kind of transcendence through imminence. By, by turning inward and thinking, we can actually transcend this realm. Similarly with Aristotle, it is a kind of transcendence through imminence. By looking at the real material conditions of the right here, right now within us, that we can actually transcend uh, the material world. Although for Aristotle, it's, it's just always happening. Anytime we engage in pleasure, pleasurable activities. Whereas for Plato, it has to be conducted very deliberately with the human mind. Now he gives us here a little glimpse into his understanding of the distinction between savoir and connaissance in this dynamic, where he says that savoir is that which we have to drag away from the interiority of connaître or connaissance, connaissance as the system that allows desire in order to rediscover in it the object of a willing, the end of a desire, the instrument of a domination, the stake of a struggle. So in this case, think about the doctor's office again. Connaître is your, the unwritten rules that guide that interaction. Savoir is the specific instances of knowledge that are demonstrated in that moment. So in this case, connaître for Aristotle, and as Foucault reads it, is knowledge, is understanding. It is familiarity with your attachment to pleasure and knowledge as a human. And then savoir is the ability to draw upon the specific instances that demonstrate and that realize that uh, your connaissance of that knowledge or of, of the attachment between knowledge and pleasure. And that puts us here into week number two. So here he begins by summarizing week one and by introducing truth into the mix. So I'm not going to summarize it because I, you just heard it. Uh, so, we kn so we know that the subject of knowledge and the subject of desire are the same, or the subject that knowledge is and the subject that desires are the same thing. But what permits desire to be attached to knowledge? How can its characteristics, that is, its uselessness, be construed as knowledge? And really, the answer is that because it is true or assumed to be true. It just is. So when it is assumed to be true, we have to ask 
that what the truth is doing here. And Foucault says that truth is doing three things, or it is playing three different roles. Its roles are to assure the transition of desire to knowledge from desire to knowledge. This is just true. It establishes the supremacy of knowledge over desire, because knowledge is that end goal that we get to through desire. And thirdly, truth births the identity of the subject within desire and knowledge, within the interplay of the two. Now, in a figure like Spinoza, for example, we see something shift here in this, in this reasoning. When he imagines the existence of a completely satisfying object in thought or in the world that will deliver uninterrupted happiness and it is not a matter of finding knowledge in happiness at this moment. It's just something that is very pleasurable in itself. So the goal for Spinoza here is the happiness that comes from it, not knowledge that can be the end point of such happiness or such desire. So this version, that is Spinoza's version, reveals a truth of Aristotle's thought. That is that contemplation of truth and happiness had to emerge already and be inscribed at least potentially in sensory happiness and the desire to know. So we must have had that first. And then with a figure like Friedrich Nietzsche, we see something entirely different. Nietzsche says that we don't have this desire to know or truth or anything like that. Instead, we have a desire to exert power. And we do that by constructing the limits of possible knowledge, by saying, I'm going to impose this knowledge on you uh, in my effort to try to find it there. What you're really doing is imposing your power as somebody who has this ability to come in, you know, mine for knowledge and then, and then leave. You are demonstrating your power in those instances, not your knowledge. So we're going to get into this more next week uh, when I cover week 13 from the text, because that's where Foucault goes into a lot more detail about Nietzsche's work, Nietzsche's idea about the will to power, and how that contrasts with the will to knowledge. But it's important to say right now that Nietzsche's intervention happens to completely overturn the Western metaphysical tradition in that it does not suggest that there is like a human, an innate human attention and capacity for knowledge. Instead, there is an innate human capacity to dominate and to exert power. And we'll get into more next week about Nietzsche's relationship with truth, his view of truth, his view of appearance, and how those figure into this entire dynamic. But then after that, we'll move away from it. And you might wonder why, why we even spoke about it, but we did. Anyways, and then there's a figure like Kant, who um, thinks about things a little bit differently, where for Kant, knowledge is, I guess it can be construed in a few different ways, depends on the translation as well, but knowledge it refers to the synthesis of all possible perception with your cognitive abilities to understand what you are perceiving and put an ordering to it. Things in the world make sense, and they make sense in harmony with one another. And that's kind of a miraculous thing if we really consider the just how arbitrary it is that humans exist at all. If you consider the history of the universe, if it has a beginning, uh, imagine a starting point all the way up to now. And in that time, there's been just so much time has elapsed where there were no humans, and even prehistory to the universe, or if the universe is infinite, right? Potentially we have trillions like of what we know to be years, probably more, uh, where there's like been a space in which the universe would emerge. And then if you consider that, you consider all of the factors that led into the formation of life, that allowed life to emerge, it is an unfathomably low the, the odds that that happened yet it happened somehow the stars aligned in such a way as to produce life and as far as we know i you know maybe someone knows better than me uh there only seems to be life on earth that we know of uh that we know of but in that case it signals to us that 
perception, consciousness, humanity, knowledge are just exceptionally rare. They, they just it, like the, the odds of it happening are almost are almost nothing. And so there's something quite miraculous in it having happened at all. And so in Kant, it is about, you know, just making sense of a world that would, you know, it doesn't make sense, really. Nothing makes sense if you really look at it along a broader continuum of the history of the universe. Everything just seems totally random, yet we are able to still find meaning in it. We're able to find community. We're able to coordinate our, our own bodies with the world as though there's like some kind of strange connection there we are able to coordinate ourselves with the more ephemeral notions of space and time which are not just like uh, parts of the world that we've like evolutionarily grown up in they are these more abstract qualities of the universe that we have this attachment to and for him for kant knowledge coordinates in some sense with that now in his framework or in his work he leaves room for the possibility that there are truths that are just simply inaccessible to humans in a similar way to Plato, but with a big asterisk where there's big differences for Plato, you know, truth is inaccessible. It belongs to this other realm for Kant. Similarly, all things are only mediated to us through our senses. And therefore we never actually interact with the thing in itself. We never actually interact with the thing as it is to itself in the world, if it can have a perception of itself without that being already a removal from it in itself. Anyways, the point is that we only engage with things through our senses, which then transforms data for our brains to comprehend, and we are given an image or a feeling or a taste of a thing. We don't actually taste the thing itself. We are Our brain is just giving us an idea of how it's supposed to taste, how it's supposed to feel. And all of that so knowledge can perhaps be understood in that way as well where there is this realm of things i'm just using the word realm again just maybe it's a little too simple but there is a domain where things exist in themselves which is what a thing is you know beneath human perception beneath all perception and that is perhaps a, a realm of truth but we can never access it so we can think of truth and knowledge in these two ways maybe in kant if anyone's like a really ardent reader of Kant, you might have, you might be like, they aren't different worlds. It's all the same world or whatever, <laughs> whatever thing you want to be annoyed about. Uh, but the, that is the point. These are different conceptions of the idea of knowledge and truth and how they intersect with one another. And yeah, that'll put us into week 13 because I'm going to cover week 13 first to uh, continue on the Nietzsche train, which actually didn't occur at the Collège de France. It took place in McGill, which is uh, interesting. I'm like, whoever got to see that talk would have been cool in Montreal. So yeah, uh, if you listen this far, I hope that you were able to get something out of it. Tune in next week for episode two. And yeah, if you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Who knows? They might get a kick out of it. You can leave comments. If you listen to this on a podcast platform and you like what I did, and you're able to leave a review, you know, do so. I read them. They make me feel good or make me feel bad, depending on what you want to do to me. <laughs> yeah, on that note, take care.